I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the work we've been doing over the years, in particular <coughs> focusing on cell biology and physiology of symbiosis and how it underpins coral reef biology. But before I do that, I want to spend a, a few minutes talking about why coral reefs are important. And you see figures you know, on the news that coral reefs are in decline, and, and, and clearly they are important enough to be in the newspapers and be on the television. But to put a few actual facts and figures around that, and, and if you do, sometimes these figures, they come from different sources, and you have to take them with a slight pinch of salt, but they're, they're ballpark figures. And it's believed that coral reefs are valued in US dollars around 137,000 to 1.2 million um, US dollars per kilometer of reef over a 25 year period. So something from quite a lot to an awful lot of money. 275 million people live within 30 kilometers of coral reef, and most of their income either comes directly or indirectly from, from the reef. Around 150,000 kilometers of, of coastline, 100 countries. Uh, is actually protected by reefs. They provide um, protection from the most, the most classic example would be the Boxing Day tsunami, where those, those um, countries and those coastlines which were, which were bordered by coral reefs often were protected that little bit more. Of all different phyla, all different groups of, 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 of different animals, 32 of them, 34, come from coral reefs, compared to just nine in rainforests. And they occupy just a small fraction of the marine environment, just 1%, and yet 25% of those fish species are associated with reefs. So just to, give you, just to give you some idea of how important coral reefs are in terms of socioeconomics, in terms of their ecology. Now, this is the classic picture of a nice coral reef. This is Palomara Atoll. This place still exists. It's way out of the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's a place of a number of myself and a number of my colleagues have worked over the years. And that's what you think a nice coral reef is going to look like. But many coral reefs no longer look like that. So on the left-hand side, again, another nice coral reef. On the right-hand side over here, many reefs are now very seriously degraded. And in fact, they're degrading at an alarming rate for a number of different reasons. And the recent statistics are that coral reefs are in about 109 countries, and there are seriously degraded reefs in 93 of those countries. 75% of reefs are currently uh, classified as threatened. That going to increase about 90% by 2030, and close to 100% by 2050, if current projections are correct. There are lots of threatened economies, lots of countries heavily dependent on their reefs, and two of our um, neighbors here, Fiji and Vanuatu, are two of those uh, <coughs> nations that heavily depend on the coral reefs and are amongst the most threatened economies uh, through the decline of the reef. And Again, this, this, this number, you can see different things. Anywhere between about 20 and 30% of the world's coral reefs are thought to have been lost already. And we're losing about 2% a year through the, through the Pacific. So why is that? Well, there are lots of reasons. Coral reefs are hammered from all directions, through very direct interaction, um, through the likes of coastal development, so building work on the, on the, on the edge of the reef. Over-exploitation of marine species, so too much fishing is a good example. You remove lots of fish, it upsets the ecosystem. For instance, you might remove a fish that grazes a lot of the, of the algae on a reef, and, and, and so the algae start overgrowing corals. Marine pollution. Now, I'm not going to talk about my work on coral disease um, tonight, um, other than just now, but it's another area of research that I've, I've worked on on and off over the years. And we looked at these things. This is, this is a, a coral tumor, and this is a little uh, a disease. This, this is called zits, or, 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 or pink spot disease. And this is caused by a little trematode, a little fluke. And we've worked on looking at the distribution of diseases like these and how they are related to environmental pressure. And there's a very close link between the incidence of such diseases and poor water quality, just the proximity of people. And so, clear link between disease incidence, which also, I'm going to talk about coral bleaching later, but disease becomes more common when corals get weakened by climate change as well. So, disease is a problem, not as big a problem as the things I'm going to talk about. Critical destruction of reefs. So, the bottom here is a picture of dynamite fishing. And just the name sounds bad. Okay, so people go on a reef, they chuck a stick of dynamite into the water and kill the fish when they collect the fish, but of course, in the process, destroy vast tracts of coral reef. And there are a number of um, what are largely illegal but destructive fishing practices around the world. This one's particularly common in Southeast Asia, that's the Red Sea. Um, it's strangely, well, maybe not so strangely, the only picture I've ever seen of dynamite fishing. Um, because I think people don't like being, having their picture taken when they're doing that. 
Okay, so, so, so but it is still relatively common for people. What I'm going to focus on this evening is climate change. And climate change is perceived as being a major long-term threat to reefs. And obviously, with, with climate, we're talking about large tracts of reefs being impacted, not just very localized effects like these, these, uh, these other ones. And in particular, rising uh, sea surface temperatures and falling seawater alkalinity, so the water's becoming more acidic in nature, those two factors are um, working together and also in isolation to stress corals. So, so they're considered the major um, long-term threats to reefs. So this evening I'm going to very quickly talk about what the current environmental limits are for coral reefs. Um, then I'm going to talk about um, the, the impact or potential impacts of climate change on the reefs. So in particular I'm going to focus on global warming, but that tiny bit about ocean acidification. Again, I could spend, I could have decided to talk about that all evening, I'm not going to. I'm going to focus on the global warming aspect. Then the question that's on many coral reef biologists' lips and has been the focus of coral reef research for around 20 years is can corals survive <coughs> if they adapt? Now the current rate of loss suggests that they can, they're not doing it very quickly, and, and, and maybe not, so, so, so there is a potential problem there. But there's still questions to be asked in terms of trying to project the future and trying to get a better understanding of what reefs are going to do so we can try and plan for the future and how we might manage reefs to try, to try and save them. So the last thing I'm going to focus on is what does it all mean, what can we do? And I'm going to try very hard to give, you know, I talk about the sort of material that students, undergraduate level, it's terribly depressing. I'm going to try and finish on a relatively positive note with, with a couple of ideas of, of how we might save reefs. So the current environmental limits of reefs, well, they work in any surprise, they by and large live in the tropics. A few of them are just outside the tropics, most are in the tropics, between 21 and 29. 29 and a half degrees C, most of them in the upper parts of the year, the, the upper reaches of 20 to 20 degrees. They're like clear water and light, and I'll explain the reasons for that uh, in, in a few minutes, but it's to do with photosynthesis. They're like water that is saturated with carbonate, and that's because they build a carbonate skeleton, and you actually have to have enough carbonate in the water for a skeleton to precipitate out. And so they're largely restricted to the tropics. A couple of exceptions will be Lord Howe Island, which has the world's southernmost coral reef. And you also get reef corals in New Zealand. Now, you don't get coral reefs in New Zealand, but you get reef corals uh, up in the Kermadec Islands. There's a lot of talk about protecting the Kermadec Islands, and one of the unique things they have there are some very high latitude corals. But it's too cold for them to build reefs, they just run rocks. So, what conditions have coral reefs evolved under? Now, there's lots of, lots of debate about climate change, about anthropogenic, and the, the, the perceived wisdom in my field is climate change is real and humans are responsible. And you look at plots like this to reach conclusions like that. So this shows the atmospheric CO2 levels in parts per million. And years is before the present. And we just look along here, carbon dioxide in parts per million in the atmosphere, well it's fluctuated. And corals have evolved during that time. The global temperature has changed a little bit. And you think, well fine, corals can do it again. <coughs> The problem comes when you look at the last few years and you look at CO2, well today is actually a very tiny bit above this now. It's about 400 parts per million and it's going up relatively rapidly. And a doubling of CO2 would be up here. So we're currently about here, so that's way above what we have been in the past. And the temperature, if you look at the slope of this final line here, yes, these go up relatively steeply, that's almost vertical. Okay, so the temperature is rocketing up as well. So whilst corals have had to adapt in the past to a changing climate, they haven't had to adapt to such a rapidly changing climate that we see at the moment. So it's not about whether they can adapt, it's about how fast they can adapt. So what will happen to coral reefs? So to understand, this is where I start getting into what I've worked on, but to understand how reefs will respond, we actually need to understand a little bit about the biology of corals. And my primary <coughs> focus is on the coral itself and a little alga, a little unicellular alga called Symbiogenin that lives inside it. And you get millions of these cells living inside the gut lining of the coral. They live inside the coral cells and they provide food to it. <coughs> we'll talk about that in a moment. In addition, and there's been a lot of emphasis on this in the lab, just really the last five years, is that you have lots of other microorganisms, so bacteria, viruses, things like archaea, that live on the surface of the coral, even in its tissues. And we know relatively little about how they interact with the 
coral, but they may, they may presumably also play some sort of role. Some of those bacteria, for instance, are very specific for the type of coral they, they, they live on. The whole other community is associated with corals. And together, this conglomerate of all these different organisms forms what is referred to as the holobiont. And that holobiont is what you're looking at when you look at a coral like this. It, it's, it's a symbiosis of multiple organisms living together, interacting together, and the performance overall of the coral is going to be linked to the performance of the individual members of that um, consortium. So then my primary focus has been on the alga, the little alga that lives inside. Tiny alga is about five microns across, and you get anywhere between about one and six living inside the coral cell, only one or two. So not very many. In fact, the actual alga is bigger than the coral cell, the coral cell stretches around the outside of it. And this is a cross-section through one of these, one of these algae, and you can see them also here, just inside. So these, each one of these is an algal cell, and then this is the animal's tissues surrounding it. The alga is then held in a little vacuole, a little bag, a little membrane bag, and all the communication between the alga and the animal has to occur across that membrane. And we're still with, with, with some frustration in trying to elucidate that membrane a little bit to try and better understand it. I'm not going to present that tonight because we have nothing to present, but we've done very hard to work on that. Now, the crucial thing in terms of coral survival is that the symbiotic alga photosynthesizes and produces sugars and other compounds. Those sugars then flow out into the animal and it uses them for support, its metabolism and its growth and its reproduction. Without that support, corals live. The reason coral reef waters are so blue and clear is they're relatively low in nutrient supply and low in food. And so the corals have evolved this symbiosis to enable them to survive in water that's very low in nutrient supply. In return, the coral, but the coral does eat plankton, and the coral eats plankton, and its excretory waste is ammonia. And ammonia contains nitrogen, and there, in H3, and that nitrogen <coughs> flows back into the alga, and it fertilizes the population of algae that live inside the coral that helps them grow. So there's a recycling of nutrients here. The, the, the waste ammonia goes into the alga, and actually, one of the, in addition to sugar, the algae produce some amino acids, which also contain nitrogen, and some of those flow back into the animal, and nitrogen gets recycled between the two partners, and so the symbiosis holds on to it in reef waters that are very low in nutrients, in addition to the algae providing all these sugars that enable the corals to grow and survive. So it's an incredibly um, efficient, highly evolved um, symbiosis enabling corals to live in waters that otherwise wouldn't support that diversity of life. So the advantage of this coral algal symbiosis are the survival in nutrient-poor waters. Also, and that's one thing I'm not going to particularly explain, but it also enhances the rate that coral can build its skeleton. And in fact, if they don't have these algae, you do get um, corals on reefs that don't contain these algae, not very many of them, but they, they can build a skeleton, but they can't build it fast enough to actually build the framework of the reef at a rate that, that counters the rates of erosion by things like waves and, and, and organisms crawling over the surface. So this symbiosis is essential for reef formation. I've just been marking exam essays today where my question was, without symbiosis there will be no coral reefs to discuss. Okay? So you should know after this, this is basically the same answer. Without the symbiosis, you would not have coral reefs. They cannot survive. <coughs> However, because of climate change, this symbiosis is undergoing dysfunction, so it's breaking down. And so on the left hand side here, you can see the typical color of a coral. Most people think they're you know, blue and red. Most corals are not. Most corals are brown. And they're brown because these symbiotic algae in their tissues are brown. And you can see them here. This again, this is each one of these little balls is one of these algae. And they give the coral its brown coloration. And when it loses the algae, the coral appears white because you're looking through the translucent tissues of the coral through to a calcium carbonate skeleton. It's a torque like skeleton underneath this. And the loss of these algae in response to environmental stress is called coral bleaching. And coral bleaching makes the news these days um, pretty regularly. And coral bleaching is a major, major threat to coral reefs. Typical stresses include, well, the primary one is heat. And when you think about global warming, that's a problem. But also light, for reasons I'll talk about, is also a serious problem. And you get whole tracts of reef that end up looking like this. So all these corals are all bleached. Now, I should say, and I'll talk about this later, they haven't necessarily lost all the algae. Sometimes they, they, they tend to keep a very small number of them, but the coral overall still appears white. And the Great Barrier Reef this year 
worst, worst episode of coral bleaching ever recorded on the Great Barrier Reef in the early part of this year, and tens of percent of, of the reef damage, particularly in the northern parts of the Great Barrier Reef. And you can see bits of the, the purple corals here also probably bleached because that's animal pigmentation, okay, so that doesn't get lost. But these corals here are all bleached, even things like sea anemones, which also often contain similar like algae on reefs, bleach. Or well, sponges also contain algae, they bleach. So it's not just about corals. Lots of organisms have evolved this symbiosis to survive in the nutrient poor waters of reefs. Having said that, not all corals are equal. And a lot of my work is focused on why some corals are more bleaching sensitive than others. And this is a nice picture taken by my um, former student of my colleague James Bell, in fact, out of Palmar Atoll. And this is a coral, same species. This one's starting to bleach. This one is completely bleached to say that's animal pigmentation that you're looking at there, that, that purple color. <coughs> same species here again, not bleached, right next door to it, that coral is bleached. Okay, so not all corals are equal, even when they're right next to each other. And that was first noted about 20 years ago, and there's been a lot of research trying to understand why that is since then. So why some more, and, and, and to note um, the kind of words about my Marsden funding at, at, at the beginning, this work links into the first Marsden grant that I was awarded when I, when I arrived uh, in New Zealand. And we, we set out to try and understand why some corals bleach more than others. By a basic mechanistic basis of understanding the patterns of bleaching. So we wondered, we particularly focus on the bottom point here, but there are other reasons why corals might be different. First of all, different coral species are different. Okay? Some are more susceptible to bleaching than others. And that's the animal, the animal component. Also, corals can adapt to some extent to the local conditions. Corals which are used to living in warm, warmer part of a reef might be a bit more resistant to the thermal stress that induces bleaching than the coral that's typically in a slightly cooler part of the reef. But the primary focus of research, not just for myself, but for multiple labs around the world, has been that different corals, even members of the same species, can contain different types of similar algae. So there are actually multiple types of these algae, not just one. And this just shows the relationship of these different algae. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, all these algae were believed to be a single species. You didn't get it in a little sea anemone that lives in Wellington Harbour. All thought to be the same thing. In fact, though, the advent of molecular um, taxonomy, molecular um, methods, meant that we could start teasing apart these different algae and recognizing, in fact, that there are potentially hundreds of types. There are even lots of different species. People argue whether they're species or we're called types or subclades here. But they're highly diverse, all belonging to this genus, Symbiodin. There are nine clades that are letters A through to I. And within those, there are multiple subclades. You read all the, all the different clades through here. Within each of those, and clade C is the most diverse. There are lots, hundreds of types of clade C, very, very common in the Indo Pacific, especially. And those different subclades are referred to as types. And those different types have different preferences for light, for temperature, and potentially for other environmental variables as well. So you can immediately see how a coral has a different algal type that has a different thermal tolerance, then you might, might actually then transfer that through to the sensitivity overall of the coral to bleaching. Now it's where it gets complicated. I'm not going to dwell too much on this. But to try and understand the mechanism that might explain this, we actually wanted to look at how the symbiotic algae may or may not um, respond to thermal stress. Now, to understand that, we actually have to understand what the bleaching mechanism is. And I'll, I'm going to give you an example, of, or, or, or tell you a little bit about why we think corals bleach. But first, hold the thought, because I'll also talk later about why this might be completely wrong. Okay. So, there's been a lot of work focused on the relationship between oxidative stress and coral bleaching. And what these two pictures show on the left, this is under normal circumstances, normal temperature. On the right, this alga here inside the coral cells. So the circle, the big circle is the alga. The second circle inside it is the chloroplast, basically the photosynthetic machinery. And the square there is the coral cell that houses the whole thing. And so that's under thermal stress. Now, under normal situation, Chloroplast photosynthesizes, it's going to produce um, a little bit of oxygen, as you can see here, and the oxygen leaks out and it's kind of harmless.
toxin, but they're basically the, the animal though detoxifies a lot of oxygen just through a pathway of events with various antioxidants. You all heard of antioxidants in you know, tomatoes and so on, and how they're good for you and how they, they help against fight against cancer. Well, similar thing here, they help fight against the buildup of toxic oxygen, which can actually cause cellular degradation. It breaks down cells, damages the cells. And so lots of antioxidants is a good thing for the alga and for the animal in dealing with that oxidative process. When you put it under high temperature and you start damaging the photosynthetic machinery inside that chloroplast. And the take on point from this is that if you do that and then you shine light on the cells, so kind of photosynthesize, you think, well, great. But actually, if you shine light and light energy on the cell and it can't process that light energy, it can't use that light energy in photosynthesis, that light energy goes somewhere else. And in fact, it's, it basically, want to put better term, interferes with the oxygen and generates reactive oxygen species. So these ones here, the 102, 02 minus, they have different forms of reactive oxygen that are generated through that light energy not being able to be processed and instead acting or producing, reacting with the oxygen to produce reactive oxygen species. Those reactive oxygen species then are proposed to leak out of the algal cell and go into the animal cell. So there's H2O2, it's hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so then you bleach your hair with it. Hydrogen peroxide, it's quite a damaging reactive oxygen species, goes into the animal cell and triggers a cascade of events, about which we know relatively little, that leads to bleaching. And you can imagine a situation where the alga is producing lots of reactive oxygen, that's in the animal monster there, is what now a toxic partner, and it spits it out. But we don't really know very much about how that reactive oxygen, that this chain of events here, links in to the animal getting rid of the alga. Anyway, so that is the, the basic principle. The basic principle is reactive oxygen species build up, and they overwhelm the antioxidant defenses of the alga or the animal, then bleaching occurs. And so this is a picture which appeared in our original Martin Grant. So this is the model that we actually wanted to test. And so again, I'm not going to do this in detail, but we've got cell again here inside the, the, um, inside the animal cell. The little orange bars here represent the chloroplast here. <coughs> and all it shows is that unstressed, well, photosynthesis is happening, there's some antioxidants, they deal with any reactive oxidant that's produced, and everything's fine. And the pink arrow shows that the alga produces lots of sugars and it gives them to the animal. Over here, though, a sensitive type of the alga and a more intolerant type of the alga. The sensitive one basically causes problems. The temperature causes problems for photosynthesis, and lots of reactive oxygen produced, and the antioxidant defenses here, represented by the blue walls, can't cope with that buildup of reactive oxygen, and the whole cell breaks down, the symbiosis breaks down. Somewhere in between here, the tolerant type here, so it's got more antioxidant defenses here and it's able to deal with that build-up of reactive oxygen a little bit better, can tolerate it, and it still continues to function. Maybe not quite as well as it did over here, but it's still continuing to function and produce sugars for the animal. So a lot of it, so the, the take-home message from this is that the antioxidant defenses of different types of symbiotic algae <coughs> are not necessarily the same, and therefore the ability of the corals to tolerate bleaching and, and thermal stress may be linked to those antioxidant defenses of those algae, so they're much better in a more thermally resilient alga. But we actually, until we did this, knew nothing about this. Now this bit I'll explain this picture. But this, this picture is some preliminary evidence which links the susceptibility of thermal stress, to thermal stress, to the susceptibility to oxidative stress. And it shows two different types. This is similar in C3 and C15, both common in corals. The top one there is thermally sensitive. The bottom one is thermally resistant. And this, if you imagine how we set this up, this, these are isolated algae. You can take them out of the coral. You can grind up a coral, take them out, and you can actually grow them in a plant. And you then take them and put them in a little well, basically a tiny, basically what looks like a tiny jam jar. And you then look down on it, and you get an image back that tells you how healthy photosynthesis is in the system. And so we've got a, each one of these is basically looking down on a little suspension of algae. It's not a single cell, it's basically a lone algae. And you can see this increase the hydrogen peroxide concentration, so, so the, the oxidative stress. The thermally sensitive one, red is bad. Okay, green's good, red's bad. And as you increase the concentration, the thermally sensitive type one is also much more sensitive to oxidative stress than is the thermally resistant one. 
Okay, so it's just a preliminary evidence showing that potentially those, those types which are thermally sensitive are also susceptible to oxidative stress, potentially providing a link between the two. I should also mention a whole bunch of postdoc here and a bunch of students um, who contributed to this work over the years. I'm not going to mention all the different bits and pieces, um, but a huge team of people were involved in, in some of the data I'm just going to show. So the first thing we did is say we looked at these algae in isolation, grow them in a flask. They're kind of hard to grow in a flask, but they grow very fast. But we can get these, these cultures and grow them in paper flasks here. And we wanted to see, just learn a little bit more about the antioxidant defenses. Are they the same in the different types, irrespective of thermal stress? Do they have different antioxidant defenses? And we, we measured how many antioxidants there were, and we looked at their structure. And some examples here, so this is superoxide dismutase, which gets rid of hydrogen peroxide. And, and this one, similar structure in the different types that we looked at. And we looked at multiple types, five or six different types of enamel. However, two other types of antioxidants here, ascorbate peroxidase and catalase peroxidase, had variable structure in different types of these algae. So first of all, all algae are not equal. So different antioxidant defenses. What that means in functional terms, not yet quite sure. Now this bottle is horrendous, and, I'm not, uh, and, 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 and I wanted to put it up just to show you the sorts of things I could show you. Okay? So, so, so this takes us from looking at the structure of the different antioxidants to actually looking at their function. And in fact, not just the individual antioxidants, but the whole network of antioxidants that work in concert to detoxify these toxic oxygen radicals inside the cell. And just on the right there, and, and, and don't worry about what these plots are too much, but there are three different temperatures, 25, 29, and 33 degrees. 33 degrees cobble over typically. 29 is sort of borderline, 25 more. We looked at a number of different antioxidants. I'm not going to go through all of these, but so there are five different antioxidants that we looked at. And we looked at how they all interact over time under different thermal stresses. And again, we've got this, here two different types of, of the symbiotidium, V1 and F1. And this point is, and there are more than this, but, but just to illustrate the point. First of all, this oval here is at 25 degrees. This oval here, the little dotted, little spot at 29 degrees, and the one with the bigger dashes here is at 33 degrees. And what, what it actually shows is that the, the network, the antioxidant network, shifts over time at different temperatures. Sorry, 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 sorry I didn't know. I just wanted to different time. But okay, so this is 33 degrees, it's the little black spot, but this is over time. Okay, so here at the beginning, here in the middle, here after about two weeks. Okay, and it shifted over time. And that was the main point. Okay, so the antioxidants in the different types are different. Here, over after, after two weeks at 33 degrees, you can see these ones have all moved over here. This one is more thermally sensitive. Okay, so there's a more, there's a more rapid shift from left to right. Um, so it's changing over time. Now it's all very well looking at cultures. Because cultures are not in symbiosis, they're not living with the coral. The coral interacts with the alga. And so we actually need to take this up to a reef and actually look at corals. Now, working with corals in New Zealand is kind of hard. You can't go collecting them at the Terminex, and yeah, we end up having to work in the field in faraway places. Terrible. Hawaii, Australia, etc. And so we went up to Heron Island, this is on the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef. Most of the world's coral reef research is done in a little tiny patch of reef about here. So the University of Queensland has a station there with hundreds of students. And so we go up there and, 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 and use their, their station. And we worked on two coral corals, Copra millifora and Montipora digitata, contain different types of symbiotic algae. This one's C3, this one's C15. And we wanted to see what happened to the antioxidant profiles over time, whether, it, whether it's similar to what we were seeing in these cultured algae. These have different bleaching sensitivities. So on the left here, for the bleached one here, um, bleached at 31 and 33, um, 31 and a half and 33 degrees C. Montipora didn't really bleach. Very minor signs of bleaching at the highest temperature, but it's very, very bleaching resistant. So you would therefore predict this one, this algae, have better antioxidant defenses. You wouldn't see that shift over time that you would see necessarily in, in the other one. It would be different. However, what we found is not what we were expecting. And again, I can show you lots of data, but I'm going to say in words. First of all, there was the, base, the, bleaching, the, the bleaching effects didn't map on to what was happening in the antioxidant defenses. There was no increase in the antioxidant activity seen in the symbiotic algae prior to bleaching. 
They didn't respond. The bleaching happened before they showed any real signs of being stressed or of an oxidative stress. The coral animal, however, showed increased antioxidant activity before bleaching. The animal responded first, not the algae. So, first of all, it showed us that the involvement of the animal in determining bleaching sensitivity of coral had been vastly underestimated. It also suggested that the mechanism that determined bleaching is perhaps more complex than that hypothesis I told you about earlier, that, that model I told you about earlier, with, with, with reactive oxygen just triggering this change of events. And is a proposed model of coral bleaching wrong? Well, we don't have this evidence. We have lots of other bits of evidence that suggest it probably is. Um, but we haven't got a better one just yet. Okay, so, so, so a lot all this work was founded on an assumption of, of published mechanisms which are probably not quite right. So much, much more work is needed. Now that brings me to this. And, and sometimes you can focus in too quickly onto too small an event. Now I'm not going to go through this, but we'll And we want to take a step back. Take a, look, take, take a look more holistically at what's going on in the symbiosis without just immediately targeting in, assuming that people are right about antioxidants, and immediately targeting that. So we've been using what are called omics. So this is genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, particularly um, Flint and Katie here. And they've been working, Flint's working on proteomics and the thermal stress, and Katie, who's a PhD student of mine, Flint's a postdoc. Um, Katie was working on the metabolomics of thermal stress. And you can generate enormous data sets. What's the downside of that, knowing what it all means? And this, this patient produced this thing here. This is looking in the, the little circles of what happens in the alga, the squares of what happens in the animal, under thermal stress in terms of lots of different metabolites in those two organisms over time. And so under thermal stress. And, and the size of the, 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 the circle square is how much, in that particular case, it's glucose. And then you can map onto any of the little dark ones here where there's a significant change in response to temperature. And you can link together all these pathways and try to understand what is going on. Very time consuming, very expensive. And, but we're starting to learn little things, and partly to actually, some of this can actually corroborate what we thought about the, the, the involvement of the animal. Started to show again animals responding more quickly. But also it starts to give us other insight into other molecules we didn't even know were there and that they might actually be playing a role. So they then get them with normal data sets and then you wonder what to do with them, which is where we're at now. Now I haven't said anything about ocean acidification so far, and I just want to take a little diversion and, and, and mention this because it's a really cool work that a, the PhD student of mine, Emma, um, did, did a few years back. And this links in the bleaching sensitivity to the susceptibility of ocean acidification. Ocean acidification, dissolving of carbon dioxide into the ocean, makes the water more acidic. And not only does that cause coral skeletons, make it hard for corals to build skeletons, it causes what's called intracellular acidosis. Basically, this in, the, the cells become more acidic and it's harder to function. And here we can see, these are, these are cells taken from corals, this is work done in Hawaii. And this is a non-symbiotic symbiodinium cell. So this is, each one of these is an algal cell. Each one of these green ones in the middle is an animal cell without an algae inside it. And at the bottom there, you can actually just see two algae inside that cell, and this little stretch bit in the middle is the animal cell, so it's stretched over the surface of those two algae. So anyway, you can see the animal cell when it's around the alga, it's finally with two in it, so that the animal cell, the animal cell gets stretched a little bit. <coughs> and what Emma did was actually use a fluorescent, pH-sensitive probe, which is fluorescent, looked at it under the microscope, and then interfered with photosynthesis. And at the top here, this is under, so this, this, is, my, this, is, a, this is a photosynthetic inhibitor. So with, or without and with the photosynthetic inhibitor. The alga here has, is basically functioning normally, and its pH is about 7.5. Okay, so on that scale there. We push the pH down, we added CO2, push the pH down to hazardous levels. But when you inhibit photosynthesis, it becomes more acidic. So the alga gets more acidic, it can't deal with that decrease in pH quite so well. The animal cell, well, it, in both cases it's quite acidic and it can't deal. It's actually not photosynthesizing and its pH is going to drop when you put it in more acidic water. Okay? It, can't, it can't moderate that external environment. The, the interesting bit though is the bottom one. When you put the two together, so you here on the left you have an alga which is photosynthesizing. And 
what it is doing is keeping, you look at this basic orange animal cell here, the pH is about 7 to 7.5, even when its surrounding seawater is acidic. And what that means is the algal photosynthetic activity is buffering against the accumulation of CO2 and the decline of, 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 of pH inside the animal cells. The animal cells are not becoming as acidic. On the right hand side, we interfere with photosynthesis then the algae is no longer photosynthesizing, and the animal cell pH drops much more drastically down to 30 to 6, more like what is in the outside environment. And so it shows a clear link between the ability, between photosynthetic um, activity and the ability to buffer against changes in seawater acidity as well. And if you imagine a particular algal cell that's more thermally sensitive than another one, that's also going to feed into what we see here. The thermally sensitive one is going to be less able to buffer animal cells against ocean acidification. I just wanted to put this in to, to illustrate the point that these two, this is often referred to the evil twin of global warming. These two factors interact. Well, they can act independently, but they interact as well. And the more thermally sensitive coral may be also more sensitive to ocean acidification. So adaptation, can corals, can corals survive? Well, this is kind of what we've been doing the last three years. So this brings why the corals can adapt. And corals, this brings out what's called the adaptive bleaching hypothesis. And um, a lot of work has been focused on this in recent years. And talk about simite switching or simite shuffling. So multiple types of algae can occur in corals at the same time. And a sensitive one is lost from a coral completely. Then it might take up a new one that is more thermally resistant and the coral is going to survive. Alternatively, two different scenarios there, but both pretty much the same thing. Corals have multiple population, a population of multiple symbiont types. One is either lost completely and the other one stays, or there's a slow shift over time as you increase the temperature. And as it gets hotter, again, it gets replaced by a more thermally resistant one. And corals can survive. We look great, corals can survive. Okay, corals told them to switch to a, to a type of algae that helps them survive. But what is the potential for taking up new symbiotic algae? That top scenario just showed them taking up new ones from the surrounding environment. Can they do it? Also, if you take up a new one, or you shift to one that maybe wasn't normally your dominant type, what are the implications of that? Will you function as well? Alternatively, can similar how we just adapt through other means? Okay, you don't see a shift, but can we also adapt through other means? I'm losing my mind. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this was a number of different students who worked in this as well, and this is the previous Marsden grant, and also so a new one as well, which we, we got luckily last week. And we started working on this anemone here. So I paste it. I paste it with lots of my, my lab or my lab or cringe when I mention my paste it because we work on it almost all the time. It's a tiny little sea anemone, it's a great model for doing sea and earth within coral reef research. Because you keep it in the lab, it grows fast, you can get rid of its algae. And then you can infect it, so you can get rid of its algae like here, and then infect them with new types and see what the effects are on the animal. First of all, first thing we found is that the algae can't just be taken up. You can't just take up any one of these types of algae. The relationship is specific. And we've looked at the surface molecules here. These are these little green blocks. There's a surface molecule. And they're different on different algal types. And that aids with recognition or discrimination as the algae are taken up by the animals. Now they're being phagocytosed, engulfed by, by, the, by the coral. Also, um, my current student, Yasmin, is, is looking at um, the infection patterns, and each of these is, is these anemone's tentacles here, and you can see at the same point, time point, the red fluorescence is the number of algae that are in the tentacles. And you see this one here, which is the one it normally contains, you can see by the one much more successful. Other ones, C3, E, you can't find them. Okay, although they're at very low numbers. So it's a very specific relationship. Corals cannot just take up any old thing. Okay? So point number one. Then there are Nutritional implications. And corals, so this is work we've we'll been doing with a lab in Switzerland on a machine called the NanoSims. And the NanoSims is a high resolution mass spectrometer. You can actually visualize the movement of nutrients through the system. So you've got an algal cell there, you sort of see them here, an algal cell surrounded by animal, alga surrounded by animal, again, algal cell surrounded by animal tissue. And what this actually shows is that two different similar types here, two in D1, two in D1A. The nutritional relationship they have when they're infected into that anemone, Ipesia, is different. And here we actually track the fate of nitrogen coming from the animal into the alga. And you can see this, this, this greener turquoise color here shows that this alga gets a lot more nitrogen 
from the animal than there's one over here. We're not quite sure why, but one idea is that it's draining the animal of resources. It's actually maybe more parasitic. Okay? Well, this one's more beneficial. It's draining the animal less and actually giving the animal more in terms of carbon and sugar stick in the other direction. So they're not all the same. The downstream effects on animal reproduction and growth, also different. So this one, when it's usual type, B1 grows faster than these other ones here, and also reproduces faster. They produce little buds around their bases, and then so the rate of budding is faster when it contains its usual type of symbiotic alga. The new, interestingly here, the new types of algae here, this control, this is uninfected, performs just as well as the ones containing all these types here. They're not necessarily beneficial. They might take them up, but they're not necessarily particularly beneficial. So there's a downstream effect on taking up different types. So why do some symbiotes do less well than others? Why do some, some infected more than others? Well, first of all, they have to circumvent the host immune system. And evolved over time to circumvent the host immune system to get into the cell and survive. Some are better at it than others, we presume. We actually know very little about the immune system, but one thing we have found, a student one, Emily, who, again, using Ictasia, she started interfering with the immune system of these anemones, and she gave what's called transponded. So as it interferes with, with the initial phagocytosis, or the engulfment of the alga, and what you actually see, you can't see this particularly, but faster rate of infection, in fact, we get what's called super infection, much higher levels of infection than we would normally see when she interferes with the immune system. And so something about the immune system is regulating that uptake. We start to know relatively little about that, we're still scratching at the surface of it. And then down the line, you have to get a functional symbiosis. So we have to be an integrated symbiosis to get that nutritional exchange to survive over time. And that is where the work that we've mainly been doing on the most recent plants on the ground. And Clint again, Ashley, Ashley there, and Jen here sitting up in the middle there as well. And they've been taking, we've been doing a lot of very novel work here, we've been infecting these anemones, and we have been, again, taking a step back, trying to understand holistically what's going on in the symbiosis. And we've been using the omics again. So we've been using genomics, we've been using proteomics, we've been using metabolomics to look at what happens when you infect different types of these algae into the anemones. And so this is some data from Jen. And what this shows, there are three different symbiont types. Symbiont is D1, the regular type, which is this anemone. D1A, a lot of interest in this one, it's thermally resistant, and it's thought to be invading the Caribbean at the moment as well, coming over from the Pacific. And no symbiosis at all. We, didn't, we just got rid of the symbionts, and we, didn't, we never infected it with anything else. And what this actually shows, this is basically a heat map, and it shows all the different genes that are upregulated. What it actually shows, the crucial thing here, this one's blue and these two are yellow. Okay? So D1, we infected with that symbiont, really shows a very similar pattern to no symbiont at all. Okay? Whereas the one that's blue is regular symbiotic alga, completely different pattern. So the expression of genes in this symbiosis is quite different. Also, the host protein profiles start mapping onto this, and the metabolite profiles start mapping onto this. And we can start actually looking at the genes, looking at the proteins that change, and trying to understand what they're doing. And one, um, it was mentioned earlier at the beginning of the Charles Fleming Award. I went to Nice earlier in the year with, with that money, and I did um, some work in, at the University of Nice there, looking at a protein called Neiman Pick protein, which has been found to be around the symbiotic algae. And we've also found it to be upregulated, uh, or, or, or I guess more abundant, in the when you infect the anemones with a regular type of alga rather than the dissimilar one. And you can see it here labeled around these algae here. Okay, so this is basically there's a layer of symbiotic algae there. Just outside it, you just faintly see the rest of the animal's tissues there. This is the layer of symbiotic algae, and you can see this protein here. We're not quite sure what it does. It might be involved in cholesterol transport, might be involved in, in the immune system. We're not quite sure yet in, in this particular case. And what I just need to do is the other sort of things we can start doing is So we can start generating images such as this, and you'll see in a moment the yellow um, probe starting to, so you can actually start to visualize what's going on inside the organism and around those algae. We look at the number of these different um, proteins to try and understand the localization as a step going on to looking at their, at their function. So where next? 
Well, this, this actually links into to the, to the Martin Grant which has just been awarded. Um, we're actually now interested, because it appears that these um, similar algae are very specific, that maybe they're not that beneficial and it gets the wrong one, what does that mean? Given that some of these that aren't that beneficial are the thermally tolerant ones. Well, it could be that the thermally tolerant one is taken up, not that beneficial to start with, but over time, the host coral selects the members of that population that are the more beneficial ones, and over time, you get evolution towards a more beneficial state. And that's currently what we're going to be looking at in terms of this respect here. Because basically, mutualism and parasitism are just points either end on a long continuum of differing um, interrelationships in symbiosis. Then my other current postdoc, um, Sean Wilkinson, who's a relevant um, postdoc fellow in my lab, is currently out in East Timor, and he's been looking at hybridization, whether different types of these algae inside corals can hybridize and produce something which could be more beneficial in the long run. Well, it's more practical than it exists tonight, but this, this distribution shows different types of algae here, different one here, and the loads, which we presume are possibly, possibly hybrids, in the middle here. Okay. So three different um, distinct populations within the same coral. So where does that all leave us? Well, 2016, this is about where we are. 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, it's about 1 degree C above where we were in the past. 2030, something else predicted, so a slightly worse scenario. And 2070, 3 degrees C, hotter, 560 parts per million. Now, that was a thing like the Paris Convention on Climate Change, which decided they're going to try and keep temperature below, more likely to go down to 1 or 2 degrees above current. Okay, so good luck with that. And if it, in the worst case scenario, we could see this going from these sorts of reefs to these, where there's corals living on rocks, to something like that. It's catastrophic. So we're going to move across, but what does it all mean? How should we respond? So, will corals adapt? After all of that, will corals adapt? Well, first of all, corals have different thermal tolerances, and they must have adapted to water temperature in the past. So, but they could do. The problem is the rate of climate change. It is the rate of change and the fact that adaptation of corals can't keep pace. In terms of the symbiotic algae, you get lots of different types, and the corals are bleached. You can take up new ones. Great. Corals survive. People were very excited when they found that. But in fact, switching, when you wholesale change your symbiotic algae <coughs> to a brand new one, is probably very rare. And when it does occur, with what we found, it's probably suboptimal. It's most likely that corals are stuck with the few algal types we already have, at least in the immediate future. And that begs the question, will those few types adapt? And that is where we need a lot more work. Will they adapt to climate change to enable corals to survive? So much, much more work is needed on the adaptive capacity and rate of the algae, as well as the corals. So how should we respond? Well, first of all, the primary thing is to stop pumping CO2 into the atmosphere, um, which would help greatly. Also, people talk a lot about reef resilience, making reefs more resilient. So, actually, while we're worrying about climate change, deal with things like fishing, pollution, and so on, to strengthen the resilience of reefs. Because those factors are important too. Then, continue research on adaptive potential in corals. We need to better understand how they're going to respond, how we model those changes and manage reefs. And people have now started to get quite proactive about this. It's a big project going on in Hawaii, with the assisted evolution, trying to basically not genetic modification, but selective breeding of corals to actually get ones which are more thermally resistant, or assisted colonization, moving corals to new places where they are, where they might survive. There's less work on that. So all is not lost. I'm going to end on a slightly positive message. Message: all is not lost. We have to act immediately. Coral reefs are in massive decline, and and while we're still, we still don't properly understand coral bleaching. We don't understand adaptation in corals, and yet we're trying to predict what they're going to do. So with that, I want to uh, hold the list of. Collaborators thank my students over the years. I also don't do anything. I just go to the field occasionally. My students were everything really the white and so on. So I have some fantastic students over the years, been very, very lucky. Uh, my postdocs as well, currently Clint and Sean in my lab. Uh, I have a number of great postdocs as well. Um, a whole bunch of external collaborators, but also my collaborators um, here at Vic as well, who I haven't gone through their names individually here. Um, Loan funding, Royal Society have been very nice to me over the years, but also some other funders as well. And I should just finish. My wife, Jo, daughter, Alice. Alice has, I think, whisked away very early on. Um, she's only five. I think this might be a little bit too much, but particularly antioxidant and diamonds. Um, but Jo is a coral biologist too. Jo is a coral disease biologist, quite, quite trained, so she understands and puts up with me when I go home. And um, so both very, very important, keeping me grounded over the years and getting things in perspective. So thank you.
So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much.